Amen. Allow me to come to the word of God. And I want to talk about the relational attributes of God. That's what I want to talk about in the next few minutes that are ahead of me. And uh, the Lord will bless us. Some people went for person to person uh, witnessing. And they came to the house of a man who departed to go to be with the Lord, who was the father of their home. And they found his son. They said to the son, would you like to invite Jesus into your heart and into your life to make him as your Lord and Savior? And this young man said, let me ask you a question. Will my father be in heaven? And then the person doing witness said, well, why are you asking that question? And the young man said, my father is late. And uh, I just want to know, perhaps he might be there. And they said to him, was he a Christian upon his death? And he said, yes, he professed to be a Christian. He was born again. And the young man said, uh, I, the person who was doing the witnessing said, I guess your father will be in heaven based on the testimony you have given. And then the young man politely declined to ask Jesus into his life. Because he said, if my father will be, ter it will be there, and he was such a terror, I don't want to be terrorized again in the life to come. You know? This tells us the way we relate, you know, with one another. And this is what the Bible gives us as we read in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and uh, chapter 2, where the Bible says, and God created man in his own image after his own likeness. You know, what is that image and the likeness of God? Definitely it's not the physical attributes that we see. So you cannot say God is physical and he has flesh and blood. But for us, because we are flesh and blood, but at the same time, the Bible says we've been created in the image and in the likeness of God. So we are talking about qualities and traits, you know, we call uh, a huge term that's called attributes, which talks of those qualities and traits that God has, and he has graciously shared those traits and qualities with us. So when we talk of the personal attributes of God, some he has not shared with us, where we say God is present Everywhere at the same time, God is all-knowing. He knows all things beforehand, even before they happen. He knows what will take place in the future. But for us, we only come and we see things happen, and then we look back in hindsight, and then you can say, now I'm wiser. Okay, so wisdom comes by you going through the realities that happen in circumstances, and then you look back, and by and by, you can say, now I can say this and about that. But God knows all things before they happen. And that's an attribute that he, uh, he does not share with us. But there are some now being created in the likeness and in the image of God. You know, there are some that he has shared with us. And those are the attributes that I want to talk about this afternoon. A W. Dosa. Ratosa, the knowledge of the holy, says what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing uh, about us. The history of mankind will probably show that no people have ever risen above its religion. And man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains I or low thoughts of God. So that's what differentiates our worship. If it is pure, it's when we actually entertain I thoughts of God. It is low, our worship is lower when we have base thoughts about God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, 
but that uh, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. So what's your mental image of God? What do you see God to be like? Do you see God to be a terror? That's actually a law <laughs> idea about God and because there are people who think God is a terror and is waiting just to strike. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christian but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Always the most revealing thing about the church is our idea of God. Okay, that's the most revealing thing about the church is our idea of God. And at this point in time, across the world, I think uh, the doctrines of the church need to be taught like never before because we are having a lot of things that are coming our way and they are trying to redefine, as it were, our idea of God and who God is. So I want to talk about these attributes that God has graciously decided in his own wisdom and love and sovereignty to share with us. And the first is the love of God. The love of God. And when I talk about the love of God, uh, I mean the kind of love that God has given to us, which is not like the love that we have as human beings. God is love and his sacrificial action in Jesus Christ gives us a, a, a true picture of love. True picture of love is what we see Jesus uh, showing us. Uh, we receive our definition of love from God. And as I said in the first service, I will repeat it again. Unfortunately, our languages are so limited when it comes to our definitions of love. But we owe it to the Greeks. Because the New Testament was written in the Greek language. And because of that, they have different expressions and forms of love. And the, you know, the first kind of love that you can uh, think about is philos love, which is the kind of bond that exists between brothers and sisters and between friends and between relatives. You know, those cycles of relationships that we have, that is now... Uh, phil uh, phileo love. But again, there is what is called the eros love, whereby we express, you know, our intimacy. Okay, so that's that kind of expression of love. But the Bible uses agape, which is God's love. It's important for you to understand that when the Lord even came to the disciples, and as I have told you, the New Testament was written in Greek. We all Remember when he was talking with Peter and he says to Peter, you know, do you love me more than this? And Peter said, I do. And the Lord repeated again, do you love me more than this? And he said, yes, I do. He repeated for the third time. And at this point in time, Peter was grieved and he said, Lord, you understand and you know all things. It's because Jesus was asking Peter, do you love me? with agapao, you know, agape love. Do you love me with the love of God? But he's replying and saying, I love you with filial love. Okay, and that's why the Lord went ahead asking him, do you actually love me with the love of God? So at times, we tend to bring our, our own definitions of love and we try to put them on God. So the love of God, this love of God is undeserved. God gave his son because of love, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. So God gave his son because he loved us. And God loved the unlovable. You read in Romans 5, 7 to 8, it says, In this, God demonstrates his own love, that when we were still sinners, God gave his son even to come and to die for us. But God's love is also sacrificial. Jesus laid down his, uh, his life in love. Okay, in John chapter 10, verse 14 to 15, he talks about him being uh, uh, the one who lays down his life for 
the sheep. He is the good shepherd. And he said, I lay down my life for the sheep. But again, Jesus sacrifices his prestigious position in love. It is out of love. When the Lord laid down his life, when he left heaven to come to earth in, in order to die for us, you know, there's this song that we normally sing, uh, uh, we sing a beautiful song. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth. So he sacrificed his prestigious position, and that was out of love. And that's what believers have been called to. John, uh, we give it to him because he's an apostle of love. As he writes the gospel, as he comes to write his letters, the letters of John, that was what he really emphasized. And in the gospel of John, he talks about a new commandment I give to you. The Lord said that. But John, as he writes his letter, says, this is not a new commandment. It is actually an old uh, co uh, commandment that you should love one another. And then the kindness of God. You know, God is kind and gracious to all he has made. So when we say that God is kind, it means that God is able to exhibit his graciousness, you know, his goodness to all that he is made. And then the goodness of God. Let me come to that. God is the source of goodness. And all that is good, we can derive it from his nature and creation. All that is good. Actually, you read the Genesis account of creation, the Lord would create, and the Bible says, and the Lord saw that which he had created, and it was good. In the evening, you know, it was evening and it was morning, the first day all the way to the seventh day, and then on the, uh, to, 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 to the sixth day before God rests. And the Bible says in Genesis 1.31, that behold, the Lord saw all that he had made, and it was very it was very good. There is such a goodness in the creation that God has created. It comes, we can derive that from God's nature and even from the creation. God is truthful. The God of the Bible is the one true God and is truthful in all his dealings. He speaks and acts truthfully in all circumstances and is utterly trustworthy in his nature. So in his nature, the Bible says he is not one to change his mind or want to say something uh, only in the evening to say, no, I didn't mean that. God does not change. One of the things that we need also to understand, we cannot talk about these qualities or traits of God without uh, really having an interconnectedness between the qualities or the traits. So when we talk of these things, we are talking about a being that is all in his personal attributes, but also in the attributes that he has allowed us to, be, uh, to share and to become part of. So God, is, uh, God does not change. He is utterly uh, trustworthy in his nature. The goodness of God. God is good in all his plans. And we have this scripture in Jeremiah 29. Verse 11, a good scripture that most people would like to quote, and it is good to quote it when actually things are thick. Okay, because that's the context. This is a scripture that was written uh, when they were going through the Babylonian captivity. Nebuchadnezzar had taken, you know, the, the Jews from, that, uh, from the kingdom of Judah into captivity. And when they get into captivity... Jeremiah himself was a prophet who was prophesying at this time. And he said, because you people have not really followed the Lord your God, that's the reason as to why you've been taken into captivity. Unfortunately, at this point in time, there were even prophets. And the Bible calls them false prophets because they prophesied to people and they said, ah, it will only take a short time and God will deliver you and take you back to your land. But Jeremiah says to these people, please, uh, make sure that you plan for the long term Be, uh, because as you go into this captivity, 70 years will pass when you are there and 70 years is a long time. And he says, you need to get into the city, you need to build, you know, houses for yourself, you need to, uh, to plant vineyards, you know, you need to seek the welfare of this place that the Lord has brought you into. So he says, in the midst of that difficult situation, God says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you 
and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and plans to give you a future. So God always has good purposes for his people, irrespective of their circumstances, irrespective of whether death occurs or there is pain or there is difficulty or things seem not to be working out for you. In that situation whereby everything looks to be bleak, the word of God says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you hope and plans to give you a future. God is good in his acts. God's works are good. Psalm 119 verse 68, you are good and what you do is good. Teach me your degrees. Jesus did good to all who encountered him. Acts chapter 10, uh, the writer of Acts who is Luke records what the Lord did. And he says, he went everywhere doing good and healing all those who are oppressed of the devil because God was with him. So Jesus did good to all who encountered him. God is good. In his provisions, God provides essentials for everyone. Essentials for everyone. Psalm 145, the Bible says, God stretches forth his hand and he fulfills the desire of every living thing. He does not discriminate. God provides for the needs of his people and God provides both the capital and the profits in business. So whatever venture we get into, God is good in his provisions. Righteousness and justice. Let me come to this. God is the righteous judge of his creatures and will always do what is right. And that's the word. Always do what is right. His justice is ultimate and pure and he acts without partiality or favoritism. That's one of the things that is there with God. He judges righteously. He gives uh, his justice that is pure without partiality or favoritism. God's judgments are just. God judges in righteousness and justice. God punishes sin and rebellion. Okay, he, he punishes sins and rebellion. God's rewards are just. God's rewards are just. God recognizes and rewards every service. God is not unfaithful to forget your labor in the Lord. If you have served the Lord faithfully with a pure motive and with such dedication, I can almost tell you there is nothing that goes to waste, but God rewards every service. God rewards even the smallest good deed. You know, you, at times you can do something that nobody recognizes, but that does not mean that God does not see. He can see that and he can reward you in a way that you least expect. God will reward every act of trust in him. You know, Hebrews 10, 35 says, do not throw away your confidence. Okay, you need patience or endurance so that after doing the will of God, you should be able to lay hold of the reward that God has in place for them who love him. So God is a rewarder of every act of trust that we place in him. The faithfulness of God. God is faithful, utterly faithful to all his promises and will keep his word fully. Oh, I like that does not abandon his people even when we wander from him. You know, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 13 that if we are faithful, uh, faithless, he remains faithful. The children of Israel as they were journeying towards Canaan and Balak, you know, wanted to cast the children of Israel and he looks for this prophet called Balaam and he comes and he offers his offering trying you know, to, uh, to, to trying to revoke God's blessing upon the nation of Israel. And finally, this is what he says. God is not a man that he should change his mind. God is not a man that he should lie. So God does not lie. That's what it means when we say he is utterly faithful to all his promise. Is there a promise that God has given to you? Yes, you can hang on that promise and I can assure you, it is a promise that is true. All who come to him according to the word of God 
will find that the word of God and his promises are yes and amen. God is true and committed to his word. God ensures his word is fulfilled. You know, he came to Jeremiah and talks with Jeremiah as a young man. And he says, Jeremiah, what do you see? And Jeremiah says, I'm seeing an almond tree. And God said, you've seen well. I watch, I look over my word to ensure that it is fulfilled, that I perform it. God is faithful to his people. God is true to his covenant with his people. Deuteronomy 7, 9, our God is faithful. He keeps his covenant of love and mercy even to a thousand generations. And God's faithfulness is steadfast. Uh, that scripture that I've talked about, 2 Timothy 2, 13, it talks of if we are faithful, uh, faithless, God remains to be uh, faithful. Beauty or desirability. God is the most beautiful and desirable being there is. All that is beautiful in the world derives its beauty from the great artist who designed and made all things. You know, there is such a wonder in creation that when you have a look at it, uh, of course, as believers, we believe that there is, uh, there is a hand that guided the creation. You see the beauty that is there in the creation. It is true that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And not just the heavens and the earth. He created everything that we can see in the heavens and those that we cannot see. He, uh, uh, the, those things that are in the heavens, those that we can see on earth. Creation is filled with a lot of beauty to such an extent that David says in Psalm 27 verse 4 that one thing I desire of the Lord is to dwell in his house and to behold the beauty of God. I guess we have not really seen that beauty for its fullness, but the time is coming when we shall really enjoy uh, the, the, you know, the beauty of God when it will be revealed uh, in its fullness. So God is the beautiful being there is in all uh, of creation. And then the holiness of God. Holiness refers to God being completely unique and separate together from anything else. So it is rightly said of God alone. That's what it means. Yet it also refers to God's complete separation from sin and anything evil. So God is separated as much as we talk, of his, uh, uh, we talk of his omnipotence and we say God can do anything. There are things that in his nature God cannot do. One of them is that God is not the author of sin. God is not the author of anything evil. So he is so separate from that so that it is a quality we can as well share. And I will pause here to point to you that it is possible to be human and to be sinless. Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. You know some of the chapters that I would say. They are perfect because we don't have the, the sin factor. Has not come into the equation. Okay it has not. You know it has not because God has created. And finally he tops by creating man in his own image and likeness. And he places Adam and says. Adam, I want you to tend, you know, this uh, garden and to cultivate. And then you come to chapter 2. It talks about God creating Eve from Adam. And after that, we see that the perfect couple is right there. And they are enjoying God's creation. They are human, perfectly human, but sinless. The person who came that we can follow in his example is the Lord. Unfortunately, for us, an idea to say for all of us, we know what it means to be a sinner. And the Bible says, for all have sinned and they have fallen short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. But it is possible now, after coming to the person of Jesus, we can experience the holiness of God. You know, the purifying uh, the purifying act of God that he does in us and we become like Jesus 
day after day in our speech, in our attitude, you know, the way we conduct ourselves, we do things the way God would want us to do them after the pattern of Christ. So we can share this holiness of God. So as such, holiness forms a nice uh, bridge between God's shared and unshared attributes. Okay, so there are those attributes, as I said, that we may not share with God, but holiness is one that really, you know, brings us and it is a bridge between God and us. So the holiness of God. Let me come to the grace of God. Now the grace of God, God's grace is positive and unmerited favor towards undeserving and guilty sinners who deserve judgment and wrath. It is an expression of his love towards those who are undeserving. It is God's expression of his love towards those who are undeserving. Grace is one aspect that we need to learn because it is by grace that we have been saved. That's what the Bible says. It's by grace that you have been saved. And it is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. So God extends grace to people who are so lost in sin that they are not even aware that they are in desperate need of God. So people could be lost in sin and they, you know, consciously they are not aware that they have a need of God. God extends that redeeming grace to the lost. But now after being born again, after coming to the Lord in salvation, God provides sustaining and sufficient grace. Sustaining and sufficient grace. And sometimes God allows us to be in situations of great testing and pain. Okay, you know, that's one thing that we cannot as human beings run away from. We can't. If you've never had periods of testing or pain or sorrow, uh, I am not a prophet of doom, but I need to invite you to life. And to say, sooner or later, sooner or later, you will experience moments when you feel, hey, why did God allow this to happen? Where was God when this is happening to me? And there are things that you can come to God in prayer, and the prayer he can answer is not to remove the pain and the testing, but you will say, I will give you grace to endure. And this is a lesson that comes hard for us because we like a quick fix. You know, situation, if you want to come to God, uh, if you are having an headache, you know, thank God for Panado. You know, we just say, you know, you can take Panado. And you, are, you know, your pain is relieved. But you come to him and he says, well, I may not take what is, the, uh, what is really bothering you, but I will give you grace. This is what St. Paul, you know, one man, he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and he talks of a man. He says, I want to boast of this man. And he says, but of myself, no. And he says, I know of a man who was taken into the third heavens. And then, of course, he tells us what he was shown. And he says, I was shown things that I cannot, humanly speaking, talk about them. I cannot explain them. And then he says, as he continues, but a messenger to keep me from being, you know, you know proud. That's the term that he uses. He says, a messenger of Satan. What this messenger was, okay, theologians and Bible interpreters really differ because they give us different versions of what the messenger of Satan was. I don't want to get into that. But Paul says, I was given a messenger of Satan to make me humble. And the Lord, actually Paul says, I pleaded with the Lord. You know, pleaded three times. And I said, Lord, would you remove this? But the Lord said, uh, I would not remove it, but my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly. Okay, some people have said this was actually maybe the messenger of Satan. Most <laughs> gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest 
upon me. So, grace that is able to sustain you, grace that is able to carry you through. You know, uh, one, uh, one time, God gave a, 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 an interpretation of somebody whom he walked with the Lord uh, for a long time. And, you know, in his dream, he saw, you know, God walked him through the journey of his life. And then he says, when he went down memory lane, he discovered something. That when things were good, there were two footprints, you know, walking together. But when things were really bad in his life, there was only one pair. Then he came to the Lord and said, I don't think, Lord, you are fair. Because, you see, when things were happy and good, you know, you are walking uh, side by side with me. But when things were so bad, I have realized, just realized, that I was all alone. Where were you? And the Lord said, well, the, this print, you know, this uh, pair of footprints that you see, actually that is not yours. It is mine. At that point in time, I was carrying you. Sustaining and sufficient grace. You might have wanted things to go, you know, ideal, you know. I, you know, there is the ideal. And, you know, you cut it out for yourself. This is my ideal life. But unfortunately, you don't live in an ideal world. Okay? And as I have talked about, sin as a way of messing us here and there, just a, a little sin. You, you, you know, the Bible says, a little foolishness, you know, brings a stench to, you, you, you know, to the perfume. So a little foolishness, not much, just a little. So you might have really done something and you slipped and at that point in time, at times you condemn yourself and you look back and say, poor me, I am here to tell you my brother, my sister, not all hope is lost. God has grace that is able to carry you and to sustain you. Amen. God grants favor. God was with Joseph. You know, the story of Joseph. I, 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 I read this and he was far removed. You know, as a young man, he had a grand vision. Grand vision. You know, that one day I will be a great man. And, you know, he liked sharing these stories with the brothers. It did not go down well. So the brothers heard him and said, ah, I think, Joseph, uh, your dreams are... Do you think you will be Lord over us? And then one day... He had a dream again that the sun and the moon uh, was bowing to him together with, you know, uh, 11 stars. Shared the same with the father. And the father said, Joseph, do you think I and your mother will one day bow down to you? Of course, to cut the long story short, he found himself in Egypt, in a foreign land. <laughs> and you know the story of Joseph. You know, went through testings as I have said. And uh, wherever he went, the Bible says, the Lord was with Joseph. Oh, I, I, I love that. The Lord was with Joseph to grant him favor. And God's grace was with Nehemiah. You know, he, he, he embarks to go back to Jerusalem, and he says, Lord, would you grant me favor even before the king? God's grace was with Nehemiah. God's, uh, the mercy of God. Let me come to that. Let me come to the mercy of God. God is, God's mercy is an expression of his kindness to people who are hopeless under the curse of sin and death. Okay, hopeless. And they are under the curse of sin and death. God is merciful to the suffering. You know, those who are suffering, God is merciful to them. And we should also identify with those who are suffering, we should show mercy. God had mercy on Israel in slavery. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. God had the cries of the children of Israel and had mercy on them. God had mercy on a bleeding sick woman, you know, who came to touch the fringe of his cloth. And the Lord inquired and said, who touched me because power has gone out of me. And this woman comes and the Lord says, daughter, you know, don't worry. 
Go in peace. Your faith has healed you. God had mercy on this woman. God is merciful to the repentant. God is merciful to those who come to him with repentance. God had mercy on a repentant nation. Jonah chapter 3 verse 10. The nation of Nineveh when they repented before the Lord. And they came to, uh, to, 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 to him in repentance. God had mercy on them. God had mercy on a repentant criminal. The two criminals who are crucified together with the Lord. One on the right and one on the left. And one of them said, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. And the Lord said, today I will be with you in paradise. The wrath of God. This is another thing that somehow, okay, God has revealed. And God's wrath is his stored up opposition and displeasure towards sin and sinners. God hates sin. Let's not really... Uh, second guess this. He hates sin and all forms of sin, but he loves the sinner. So if you are here today and you have done things that are not right in the eyes of God, he calls sin a sin, but he expresses his love and he also brings his wrath upon the sin. It is his utter abhorrence of evil and an expression of his holiness and justice. Romans 1.18 says, you know, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Paul says, because it is the power of God for salvation to the Jew first and then to the Greek. And then he says, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed to everyone who believes. Revealed. To everyone who believes. It is an expression of God's holiness and justice. And then finally, the jealousy of God. God's jealousy is his only desire that his people worship and give their hearts only to him. You know, you shall not have other gods besides me. You shall not make idols for yourself. You shall not bow down to them. So when the Bible talks of God is jealous, he desires that our, uh, our good is that we worship him alone and we find satisfaction with him. God's jealousy is not an irrational human jealousy, but rather his knowledge that is what is best. God is what is best and most satisfying to his creatures. God's jealousy is an expression of his wisdom and his love for his people. That's how God expresses his love and his wisdom. Let me ask the worship to come. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, but grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Oh, I wish that as we really take stock of how we can relate with one another, you know, in an horizontal way, even as we relate with God in a vertical way, as we get these attributes, these qualities, these traits that God has given us, his love, his mercy, his grace, his holiness, you know, his kindness. You know, it's by the kindness of God that he has given us his mercy, you know, and then his grace, the fact that all that we have, we don't deserve to have them in the first place. But because God is gracious, he has granted us grace for salvation and grace to sustain us in the journey of salvation. They are the names of God, the Hebrew names of God. Uh, I have quite a few here that we see in the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, Elohim. You know, that's what, uh, you know, Elohim. The name Elohim. The strong one, the divine. You know, that's God. In the beginning, God. And then Adonai, Lord indicating a master to servant relationship exodus chapter 4 the lord you know adonai and then el elion most i the strongest one genesis 14:20 el roy the strong one who sees the god who sees and then el shaddai almighty god genesis 17 el olam everlasting god and yahweh you know this word was written for us to pronounce. Jews, uh, you, you know, the original writing of this name is not uh, pronounceable. You cannot pronounce it. You know, Yahweh, Lord I am, meaning the eternal 
the self-existent God. But this God who is self-existent has decided to create us in his own image, in his likeness. We can have a relationship with him, but we can also have a relationship with one another. John says in First John that I have written to you because our fellowship is with the Father. Our fellowship is with his son, Jesus Christ, and our fellowship is with one another. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And this is how we can relate and show these attributes even to one another. I know there are moments when we fail. There are moments when we falter. There are moments when we don't feel like it. But I'm here to tell you the grace of God has been given to us. Even in our weakness, we can experience the power of Christ.